I'm shocked that doesn't mean the microphone stays here. <laughs> so we now have Alden Habakon. Um, and uh, so I started speaking about him. So I'll complete that right now. Okay. Uh, is an accomplished diversity and inclusion specialist. Um, he is the director of intercultural understanding strategy development for the University of British Columbia and previously the manager of diversity initiatives at CBC, that's where I met him, CBC Television. He is the publisher of Skira Magazine and the co-founder of uh, Asian Canadian Journalists Association. And his topic today is, what is an example of cultural misrepresentation in Canadian mainstream media? So what, um, so what was done about it? So thanks, Ian and Ajay and the, all, the entire Co-op Culture Group for uh, uh, organizing today's panel. It's really an uh, honor to be part of Media Democracy Day. Uh, I've been watching it for a number of years, and so I've been longing for a chance to participate. So here, here, here we go. So I've been asked to share some examples on misrepresentation in mainstream media. And I'm going to speak really fast because we, I wasn't really given um, all that much time. Um, the first thing I want, to, I want to make clear is that media is media. It's a mediation of reality, which means all media is subject to being a misrepresentation of reality. There's no media that isn't, uh, um, you know, that's neutral in this way. Even a documentary doesn't replace and cannot replace the experience of being there. So this slide is a, a picture that uh, Chris Krug has, uh, took of me at a presentation that I did at TEDx Vancouver a number of years ago. And that presentation is available on YouTube, and you can watch it as many times as you possibly can. It'll never be like the same thing. And even as I watch it, um, it feels a little surreal to watch myself give that presentation. But it's, uh, and, and sometimes, like like Chishma said, media can actually be better than the real thing. Mm -hmm. And and that's partly why um, I think it's even more imperative for media producers to, to understand the consequences of their uh, editorial decisions. Um, sorry, we forgot our clicker today. So uh, even, even when the experience is in real time, often with social media, we'll say things like, well, it's in real time, so that means it's less mediated. And, and, what, uh, and I actually think it's a bit of a, a false uh, statement. Uh, this is an art installation called The Telectroscope, uh, wherein the artist uh, Paul St. George connected London and New York with a virtual tunnel. These are passerbys in New York looking at Londoners in real time and in HD through what appears a tunnel. And, uh, and, and it, literally, they're waving at each other, which is really exciting piece of art. But despite that real-timeness, it's still a mediation. It's still a media reality. What we are responsible for as a democratic society is the range of acceptable thresholds between the media reality and reality. Media reality is so powerful that it can influence our thinking and sometimes surpass the influence of reality itself, or be mistaken as reality. Secondly, there are varying degrees of mainstream media, and Shishma spoke about that a little bit. For the most part, when we say mainstream in Canada, we're actually talking about English language media. But in some, to some degree, Punjabi language and Chinese language media are also mainstream in the context of Vancouver. And there, there's some tension between um, these uh, major forms of media. One of the reasons I got into media was because I was, at the time, too visibly ethnic to be found in conventional English language mainstream, and I was too socially mainstream to be found in conventional in language or ethnic media. So I chose to be the media. This was one of the covers I published about 10 years ago for a magazine called Rice Paper. They have a, a stand upstairs. It was a technology issue, and I was faced with the dilemma of finding a place where technology and identity intersect. And this is 10 years ago. This is before we had things like web blogs. Uh, where I found it was the import car shows in Vancouver. Um, and what I found when we got there was that there were no female drivers. All the Asian women in that space were essentially decals for the cars. So we placed one of the models for Garage 5, which is a huge garage uh, in Richmond, and tried to shift the paradigm so that she was in fact the driver. And in the following year, when we made our tours through the, the uh, uh, import car shows, there were, there were female drivers. The import car enthusiasts were just becoming mainstream then, um, but with the never-ending Fast and Furious series, which will go, I swear, to 15, uh, it's definitely mainstream now, almost passe. The definition of mainstream is in fact in flux so long as the identity of mainstream continues to shift. 
There are so many examples of misrepresentation in the media. I, I really had a challenge trying to narrow which ones I'm going to talk about. And often when we say the media, we actually mean the news. What I have uh, have seen, having worked at CBC for six years, is that this misrepresentation in the news can be fixed because it, because it is generally attributed to cultural incompetence, laziness, and the pressures of deadlines. And I have a really timely example of that a little bit later on. But the most influential, the most influential are in fact not the news, but mainstream film and television. When producers took the popular cartoon Dragon Ball and decided that mainstream audiences were not ready for an Asian-looking Goku, they took a popular Asian character and cast a visibly white actor. And we're not talking ethnically ambiguous, right? He doesn't kind of look Asian, right? But then who would notice, right? Who would care that Goku was an alternative hero figure in the imaginations of thousands of Asian youth living in North America who have struggled with predominantly white representations of mainstream superheroes? Producers will tell you, adamantly, passionately, it was all about the money, nothing personal. Perhaps this is tied to the mainstream mythology in North America that presumes heroes must in fact be white. Heaven forbid that an actual Aboriginal looking person save the Eskimos from oil companies. Don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of Steven Seagal for his martial arts, but when he made and starred in On Deadly Ground, where he actually became an Eskimo, he crossed my threshold of acceptable media reality. Next. But this doesn't even touch the brutality of misrepresentation compared to the casting of David Carradine over Bruce Lee in the TV series Kung Fu. Carradine played a character named Kwai Chang Kane in a time when TV producers truly believed in their hearts the American public was not ready for an Asian-looking actor to play an Asian. <laughs> in 2007, uh, our public broadcaster, CBC, produced the first primetime TV miniseries in North America to cast an all-Asian Canadian lead cast, complete with Asian-looking bad guys and good guys. Now, the problem with mainstream TV is that it is measured only by ratings, and it is a well-known fact in the industry that youth, people of color, Immigrants and Aboriginal people are not well measured by conventional rating metrics. The most wide-scale wide misrepresentation in Canadian history remains the Indian Residential School Program. History textbooks are a form, if not the most influential form of mainstream media, and for most of the Indian Residential School's history, it's been omitted from media. In 2008, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was announced following the government's apology, CBC set out to cover it. For whatever reason, CBC's senior news management had sent out an edict declaring that those who had experienced this, this um, Indian residential schools firsthand would be called former students. Earlier that year, CBC had staged its first forum around the representation of Aboriginal people in the news, bringing together for the first time in Canadian history CBC's Aboriginal journalists and senior news management. The network of journalists were outraged at the decision to call survivors of the Indian, Indian residential schools former students, implying that they were comparable to private schools like STM or LFA, as opposed to the reality that they were not schools, but a program meant to extinguish Aboriginal language, culture, and people, and in many cases had at least a 50% mortality rate. Many journalists threatened to quit, there was an emergency conference called over across the country, and the news management successfully averted a potential media catac cataclysmic disaster. Because of this scale of misrepresentation, we are all Where I've seen progress is in fact advertising, by far one of the most dominant forms of mainstream media. In this recent bank ad, there's something about this woman that reads as you're not typical, as not your typical Chinese immigrant. Possibly mixed race or hapa, it's, it's, it's rather ambiguous. But if you look at her name, it is also very Chinese. You also notice that Melanie Chong was a customer for 30 years, which implies she's been in Canada since a young child. There's something very nuanced here, and it speaks to the notion that in a multicultural society, People pay attention to media that pays attention to them. Representation in mainstream media means different things to different people. One of the most inaccurate representations of Asian Canadians, for example, and Asian Americans, uh, Asian American communities, is the notion of the model minority, arguably perpetuated by the communities themselves. In MTV's upcoming series, K-Town, which is essentially a raunchier Korean-American version of Jersey Shores, soon to come to your TV sets, we will get to see American-born Koreans act as badly as they want. And it's that choice to be represented as you choose, good and bad, which is at the heart of social empowerment and media democracy. Thank you.
She then joined the David Suzuki Foundation a year ago to campaign for clean energy and climate solutions. She was the news and current affairs director for Fairchild Television, um, Canada West, and has won five Jack Webster awards for her work. An amazing person. And Willie's topic today is how can we work together? Is it realistic for a diverse media landscape to share stories across each other's outlets? Is it practical? And I think it is, but I'll let, I'll let her talk and, and say, you know, um, diverse media is as diverse as you want it to be, and as inclusive as you want it to be, and as exclusive as you want it to be. And I'll talk about that later on, but Winnie. You've noticed that I don't have to move the mic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ages ago, when I first started at Petra, I was already told by my boss, who's six feet two inches tall, that the smartest people are not higher than five two. So <laughs> I totally fit into that category. And <laughs> so um, I actually put together some slides, but I decided that I don't want to put together a script because. Uh, I always read from a script, so I actually wanted to use this occasion to see if I can actually talk to you guys about what I put together. So the topic for what I picked uh, for today is basically down to this question, that um, do media actually work together, uh, can it be done, or is it even realistic? So I think uh, the first thing we need to know is um, because we do talk about a lot of different medium today, um, and it's a very complicated world these days. So we, um, our speakers earlier have already talked about this social media, there's also mainstream media. So if you want to talk about all these different diverse media working together, I think first of all we need to know who's out there, well, who are we really talking about. So um, yesterday I put together a whole bunch of pictures um, and of different media outlets from the ethnically diverse and also the mainstream and non-mainstream. And in fact, you know, down to the bottom line, they're all mainstream nowadays. So when we look at, um, as Alton said earlier, that the media today, in Canada especially, we really talk about the news media. And for a person who came from Hong Kong um, as a kind of old teen teenager coming to Canada, that is actually a big cultural shock for us, because in Hong Kong, um, and I would expect in China these days also, that news is not the big deal. It's drama, it's uh, soap series, day and night, um, it's all of those things, so advertising uh, infomercials. So news is always put to the bottom of the, the pack. But in Canada, it's completely different. And so when I came to Canada and realized that in fact our whole world surrounds um, around the news media, um, it was a big cultural shock, but it's also very interesting. So what we do know is that when we talk about the news media today, um, it's also more complicated than you would think. Because when you look at these pictures, um, you see the national newscast, but you also see the local newscast, and then you have the Chinese um, language, and they compete with each other. Uh, and you also have the Punjabi language newscast that is broadcast in their own language. So we really have a lot. Um, but then when we talk about broadcast media, uh, it's not just TV that we're talking about. Um, we're talking about radio also. Radio is an e uh, even more vibrancy. And when you look at the, the number of pictures, and there are a lot that I have actually left out, but I did put in RJ. Radio. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah, and um, I learned that from my colleague at the David Suzuki Foundation that Red 